Welcome to another edition of Sports Addicts NBA Edition. Um, this is a special episode. We got a guest um, on with us. Um, it's Kevin Herter, guard out of uh, from Atlanta Hawks. Uh, he was drafted 19th overall back in 2018. Um, it's entering his third season uh, from the University of Maryland. Really excited to have him on. Um, can't wait to dive deep into the conversation we have planned with him. Um, and what he expects for this upcoming season. Zach, what are you ready for? So we got some stuff about college. He has an interesting take on college that I think a lot of current pros don't have, so that's something to look out for. Um, then we get into NBA stuff with his new current team. Obviously, he's still playing for the Hawks, but the team looks entirely different. Um, and then we're going to wrap it up with some very non-basketball-related things to get you a better <laughs> idea of who Kevin is, and uh, you can get used to Kevin that way. Um, so we think we have a pretty good conversation. And hopefully you enjoy this. And this is hopefully the first of several interviews coming down the pipeline. All right. So it's time. We got Kevin Herter here. Thank you for joining us, dude. So you're sitting in, in Memphis right now in between preseason games, right? Yes, sir. We, uh, we actually we just had practice this afternoon. So got back. It's two and a half hour practice before games. So it's definitely telling you it's preseason. But, yeah, thank you guys for having me on. So um, what's, what's it like right now? You, you can't leave the hotel, right? So you, you're kind of stuck in, in purgatory a little bit? Yeah, it's weird. It's uh, like our routines are so thrown off. Um, kind of the best part about going on the road in the NBA is, is being able to see every city and, and a lot of guys. Once you get in off the plane, you go out to, di- you go out to dinner, go out to eat. Uh, if you have people in that city that you know, you, you might go see them, hang out with them, and then you play the next day. And, and right now you can't do any of that. So, you know, our rules are literally for – we can go walk around down the street, but we can't go inside anywhere. Uh, we can't leave the hotel regardless. We can only eat at – they in every city the NBA has designated certain restaurants that they have as, like, their COVID, whatever, have done the right things. And uh, those restaurants close down for us, and we can go in and eat. So when we got here uh, a couple of days ago, we had a team meal there. Other than that, all our team meals have been in a banquet room. Um, we wake up every day. We have to, we, we have to test literally every day. So I've tested for COVID probably for the last two months straight, like every single day. Um, and yeah, other than that, it's like you're sitting around your rooms. I got, I got the PS5 in here hanging out. Uh, <laughs> practice being two and a half hours was kind of like, it was good. It was something to do today. Other than that, you'd just be sitting around. So it's definitely weird and your routines and the fun part about the NBA is a little bit thrown off. All right, so we're just going to go through your career, basically. You're only in year three, but we're going to start with college. So you kind of – you had a little bit of a different journey than I think a lot of college recruits do, and you chose a school pretty quick. You didn't take all your official visits, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I know you, you thought of it as kind of a stressful moment. So can you talk to us a little bit about, like, the whole recruiting process and, and why you chose school so quickly? Yeah, the the recruiting process, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, I uh, – I really didn't have, I had a lot of local interests. So I had the CNE Albany, um, you know, a couple of Northeast schools as I was going throughout my junior year my, in, in high school. And uh, once we, that year, we made it to the state championship. And I think the first team that saw me uh, was Syracuse, was at our state championship game and talked to one of the coaches afterwards. And then we played in a federation game. And that was the first game that Maryland had been to. So it was really throughout the end of my high school throughout the end of that year and that run was, uh, was the first time I started to get national interest. And then from there on that spring playing AU, you know, I got a lot of offers really quickly, but I remember about that time, one of the, the best parts and for me, what was a lot what was really cool was every time like your phone was constantly ringing and there were all of these, these numbers that you didn't recognize, but it always had the area code and it had like the town or whatever, where all these teams are from. And so like, I would be sitting in that spring, I was in baseball practice and like, literally I'd be, I'd be sitting there after school or, or in the middle of it. And I'd get a, a random call from a number and it's like, whatever coach was calling. And it was like South Bend, Indiana, uh, Eugene, Oregon, and, and from Maryland, College Park, Maryland, it had all these area codes. So at the time I was like, Oh, sick. Like this school must be calling. And then it was, you answer the phone and you talk to whoever. Uh, so yeah, so went through that summer, kind of got a lot of interest and, the thing that about recruiting that's that's tough is uh, for me I, I wanted to keep all my options open so I kind of fielded calls from everybody. I really didn't know too much what I wanted. I think I wanted a big school that had football that was involved, but I wanted it to be like really good, obviously basketball, but I could want a, like a bigger school feel. And 
I went that summer to a camp in LA for high school and that was in LA and I realized it was really far. So right there, I like told all the West coast schools that recruited me that I probably wasn't going there. You guys are too far away. It's just, I want my family to be able to see my games. And that was the first time I'd been to LA, the first time I had been to the West coast. So I really had no idea up until that camp. Um, so came back East that whole summer, uh, was kind of getting recruited the same way again, taking a lot of calls and, and then it just, it kind of got exhausting a little bit just because it was almost every night I was on the phone for a couple hours with coaches and they're all kind of saying the same things. You know, a lot of the conversations were pretty repetitive and they're all preaching kind of similar things. And, um, so I kept kind of, you know, breaking my list down, um, talked to different people throughout the industry and, uh, finally came up with, I think it was 10, eight or 10 that I liked. And, um, and from there kind of went, went forward with those schools and, Set my five, set four official visits. It was Villanova, Maryland, Michigan, and Notre Dame. And I was leaving my fifth open just because I didn't know, hey, if I go to those four schools and, and I didn't know what fifth school I wanted to take. And so went to Villanova, really liked it, um, came away from that visit and, and really liked the school. They were obviously really, really good and they're going to be really good. And then went to Maryland the following weekend. It was like, it was back to back to back. So I had like my whole month of September was official visits and uh, went to Maryland the following weekend and it kind of blew me away. And they're definitely school. Like I said, they're the second biggest school to come see me. They came to the Federation in high school. So they had been recruiting me for a long time and they had seen my game. And I went to, went on that visit, came away with it. And uh, I remember I was in the airport flying back with my parents and, I kind of looked at both of them and they kind of gave me a look and it was kind of like, that's going to be pretty tough to top. Like, I don't know how much, uh, how many more schools I need to see. And so what my dad always tells me with anything, any big decision is you sleep on it, you wake up the next day, let all the emotions out of it. And so I woke up the next day and felt really good about it um, and committed and called coach Sturgeon. I think that was like the day before school started going into my senior year. Yeah, so to follow up on that, you, I'm going to let you talk about this because you kind of have a soapbox about this, but I know you like to tell recruits to take the spot where you're going to play more than go to, like, the Duke or Kentucky. Um, and obviously you knew you were going to play a lot at Maryland. So how much did that factor into that decision too? That was a huge factor. And to be honest, that was, that was the reason I didn't go to Villanova. And I remember on my visit there, I think you know, Dante DiVincenzo was a redshirt and they already were playing like five guards. That was the year they won. So I visited, they won the national championship and then I went to college the next year. And so they had a lot of guards. And uh, so that was just somewhere I was like, oh, this is gonna be really good for me, but I may not get on the court to my junior year if that. And that's the thing about that. It's tough watching college basketball. It's tough watching my peers and people I know are, are picking schools that they probably can't play at as a freshman. And then college basketball these days or if you don't play you transfer and then it's just I feel like it's never the same and so that was a big part for me it was going somewhere I knew I was going to play and Maryland that year was supposed to be really good the year I visited but they had they had like two or three seniors they had I think Mello Trimble who I thought was going to be leaving they had Diamond Stone who left so they had all these guys where their roster was going to be pretty depleted but they're bringing a good recruiting class they're bringing back a couple guys so I knew I could walk into a situation where you know, if I did the right things, I was going to play a lot on, on a good team. And it kind of, it's funny how it worked out with Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame ended up taking a different recruit. Michigan took a different recruit over me, um, which it's funny. I follow, I'm not going to say who, but that recruit <laughs> ended up transferring out of Michigan two years later because he didn't play there. Um, so everything kind of worked out, you know, going to Maryland. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously peers, there's guys that follow people um, that are, are from the area, Capital District. And that's one thing I always tell these guys is go somewhere you're going to play. That's where you're going to be happiest. And you know, it, it's never fun sitting on the bench for two or three years before you get the chance to play. Sure. And playing in the Big Ten, I mean, the Big Ten is not necessarily known as a, a conference that produces NBA guys. Um, I mean, when you look at other power conferences, you're looking at like ACC. They have, I think, 87. Um, Pac-12 is up there. Um but playing in the Big Ten, I think it's very physical. It's very competitive. How do you think that kind of prepared you for the NBA? Yeah, it was definitely – it was physical. Like you said, it was physical and competitive. Our, uh, going in, I remember my, my freshman year, definitely that physicality. And it was a lot different from going to our non-conference games at home and 
we're playing lesser opponents and then you jump right in and, and I'm asked to guard, you know, big 10 three men who at the time just outweighed me were a lot stronger. And uh, so at that point, yeah, it definitely did prepare me for the NBA because I kind of walked into the same thing as, as a rookie going to the NBA. It was the same type of situation. Uh, but yeah, like you said, the big 10 is known for being a little bit more physical, being a little bit more rugged. The ACC is known a little bit more for being athletic and, and teams that play a little bit faster um, but I think when I was looking at schools too, that wasn't really something I was looking at it was conference. It was definitely school and the right fit, but the big 10, it definitely does help prepare you. All right. So you go to Maryland, you're you, like, you've said this before on other things, but you, you always dreamed about playing in college. You always dreamed about going to March madness, making the tournament, making deep runs in March. Um, but then after year two, you get an invite to the combine and you just have a freak show performance at the combine. And all of a sudden you're, told you a first round pick so now you got to decide all right do I give up two years of college do I go what happens um so talk us talk to us about the combine a little bit and how you made that decision because I know that was one of the harder ones you've ever had to make it was the hardest decision of my life <laughs> and I don't know if there'll be <laughs> I don't know if there's gonna be another decision that that uh is ever harder that I'm gonna have to make or hopefully there isn't but um yeah that was kind of a situation that I really wasn't going to test the draft waters I think with how that season ended my year two, we lose first game of the Big Ten tournament against Wisconsin. Um, and, and I went into that off season, like really not thinking one, I was on NBA radars and two, it was like, I'm not ready to leave yet. Like I want to win. We thought we were going to end up getting to the NIT. I remember we knew we weren't, weren't making the NCAA tournament. And so our whole team, I remember we had practiced that day. We had like a full week of practice, like hard, legit practice. And we're all sitting in – our training room and so I like have these Norma Techs on there's a guy in the ice bath there's like our whole team is like doing something watching the NIT selection show and we thought we were going to be two or three seed like we're going to be in and our name doesn't get called and it was like we're looking around like looking for the coaches like what the hell just happened like our is our season over with and so it was like I remember it was just dead silent like I took off the Norma Techs walked straight in the locker room changed and left like I was pissed um and I think we got invited to do a different, different tournament or different postseason thing that year. Obviously, we didn't do it. And uh, so the way that year ended, I remember it was like, I want to run it back. Like we, I knew we had Jalen Smith coming in. We had this Aaron Wiggins. We had Eric Ayala. We had like a really good class coming in. Um, other recruits at the time that we thought we could get. And I was like, let's run it back. Like we could have a special team next year. And then. I'm sitting there and a couple of weeks go by, I see a couple of guys declare and put their name in that I'm like, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that guy. And so I get on the phone and I'm talking with my dad and my dad is like, what are you thinking? Like, is this something you want to do? Like, it's, it's something that we can look into if you want to. And I'm like, I don't really think I need to, like, I don't think I'm leaving. Like, so why would I do it if, if I know I'm not leaving? And he was just like, well, why don't you do it just, to like just for the competition like I, I've been talking to people that say you, you could probably get invited to the combine why don't you just go there and play against guys at least you go there you play against them these guys that are going the NBA you go back to college better you know what you need to work on to do it next year so I was like he kind of like talked to me and I was like fine like I'll go there I'll just I'll just play against guys I get a get good pickup in and so put my name in um and, and get uh it's he's my agent at the time but I think at that point you can you call me your advisor so I'm with Mark Bartlestein Priority Sports and so he's giving me really good feedback we get to the combine and like I, I play really well like I tested really well in terms of all my athleticism stuff and my agility and then the first day of scrimmages I played really well and um so I get off after that day and I'm, and I'm back at my hotel and like Mark's raving about it and my dad's like well I you look good and, and all these people are texting me like who were watching on tv or whatever like you look really good and so the next day at the time too i needed surgery on my pinky so the whole time i knew it, whatever this process was gonna be done i needed to get surgery to i had a torn ligament in my hand and so a lot of times you do in that situation is like if you play really well just to not you know i guess not make yourself look bad the second day or you show that you know you leave scouts, whatever that, just to remember, I sat out the second day and it was something like you played well enough. This is what they saw. We don't need to play. And we're going to use your hand as an excuse. We're going to tell them your hand is bothering you. You messed it up. So I go on the next day, like, Hey, I'm not playing. And so that guy, they're good. So I leave the combine 
and like right away it was like within days it was like all of a sudden I was a first round pick and Mark was hearing all this stuff and I'm like honestly at the time I'm like like damn I'm like this is going to be a harder decision like I thought it was a like, second round pick like I'm going back and uh, so finally he's just like we have we have a real decision to make and so I did a couple more did a couple of workouts, flew out to LA. I was supposed to have one in Utah. Had a really good workout in LA. They were picking at 25. And, you know, at that point, they pretty much told me, like, if you're there at 25, we're taking you. Like, you're not getting past us. And so I was like, okay, now I know I'm a first round pick. Now it's like, that's guaranteed money. That's four years, whatever, in your contract. And, um, and so there it was kind of like Mark was fielding interest teams all the way up to like 12. Was, I met with the Clippers before I left that they were saying they liked me and, um, they don't know about for 12, but like they're going to watch more film and that they really liked me. So then there's like, it's like three weeks till I have to make a decision. So I go home and I did get the surgery. So I go home, I got the surgery in my hand. So now I'm just like sitting there with a, with a wrapped hand. And then that's where all like the Twitter stuff starts. Where it's like, people are tweeting out like what I'm doing. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like, how do you know what I'm doing? Like all these verified, whatever accounts are like, Hearing, hearing Kevin Hurd is going back to school, hearing Kevin Hurd is staying, I'm just like, someone tell me what to do because, like, I, I really don't know what I'm doing. And, like, it's, it's boiling down. I think Bruno, Bruno says he's going back to Maryland. So, I'm like, all right, like, we're going to be really good. Because it was first Bruno was, was saying he, he was probably going to stay in, and then, and then he goes back to school. So, again, I'm looking at him like, like, we could, like, compete for a national championship if I go back. Like, this is what I've always wanted, like, wanted to play in the NCAA tournament. And – so a couple weeks go by and, and Mark was pretty much like, Kev, I don't think you're getting past 20. Um, and so you kind of look at the numbers with that. And it's one of those decisions in life that I didn't want to make it. And finally one day it was, I woke up and, um, you know, everything was telling me that you should leave. Like this is the time to go. And I called coach Turgeon and told him I won't be coming back. And that was kind of it. Jeez. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, I mean, with all of that, it's like a whirlwind from like six months, you're planning on going back, trying to make a run in the tournament. Now you're in the NBA um, with the Hawks. So what is that? What was that transition like jumping into the NBA? Obviously, skill, everyone's significantly better. Everyone's coming from college, being the guy and they come in. Now you're a role player. But what's the biggest difference you see besides that pure skill level from NBA and college? The speed of the game, um, the athleticism of every player, the length of every player. It's funny. It's like you can feel – the NBA court feels bigger. Like in college, in a way, you always kind of feel like you're next to people. The court's smaller. The players aren't quite as big, but you can pack the paint, obviously. So you always – when you're on defense, when you're on offense, you just feel like everyone's closer. When you're, on, when you're on NBA court and you're guarding someone on the wing, it feels like you have no help. Like it's like nobody's around you. You're just one-on-one -on -one with this guy. And so it's definitely an adjustment. It's an adjustment offensively. There's just, there's so much more space on the court. Defensively, you feel like there's nobody helping you out. And on the flip side, it's just these guys are just – they're athletes. They're long. Um, and obviously, their skill level is definitely a step up from college. So that was the first adjustment, is just kind of adjusting to the speed of the game um, and the length and athleticism that's involved in the NBA. And it was tough for, for my hand. I missed summer league, so I missed a couple games that – uh, other rookies that were in my class got to play. And so my first game action was preseason and <laughs> I was pretty bad in the preseason. So once the final, the regular season started, there was a couple of guys got injured on our team. I started to play better and uh, just kind of put in a role where they had to play me just because there really weren't any other wings on the team and had guys had kind of gotten, um, gotten hurt a little bit. And once I started playing a lot, I started playing a lot better and, um, and ever since then, it's, it's obviously been better. But, yeah, the first couple of preseason games, I didn't know how many games I was going to be spending in the NBA that year. All right. So, <laughs> for me, I think the coolest part of your, your career so far is the Dwayne Wade moment um, where you got to switch jerseys with him, obviously. So, growing up, he was one of your guys, uh, and you were a Heat fan, and Dwayne Wade was kind of your idol. So, just talk about that moment a little bit because that was pretty cool to watch from television. So, I can't imagine how it was, was to be inside of that moment. Yeah, it was uh, – we really – we first became Heat fans, my brother and I. One of my dad's best friends from college, she covers the Heat. And so I remember when we were younger, he sent us a pair of D-Wade's Converse shoes, and it was kind of like we had Dwayne Wade's. And so that was kind of the start of it, of, of having his shoes. And um, 
and yeah, we followed him, and he and he wore number three. I was wearing number three, and we're Heat fans growing up. LeBron goes there, and, and all of a sudden, I'm watching the Heat a lot more. Even though I didn't watch too much NBA basketball growing up, but then finally the chance to get to play against him. Um, that first preseason, my rookie year, we were both coming off the bench. I was in the second unit. He was coming off the bench at the time, and so I remember I checked in the game, and I'm I'm walking. I'm like, all right, I got I got Justice Winslow. And all of a sudden, the horn rings, and, and D Wade's taking Justice Winslow out. So I'm like, "All right, apparently now I got D Wade. Like, I wasn't ready for this." Um, so just having the chance to play against them for me was like crazy. And we played the Heat that time like five times during our division. Played them in the preseason, and then the last game of the year it was uh, it was the same thing. My our connection, one of my dad's friends, he he covers it. He he kind of let D Wade know when I first came in the league. He's like made a joke of like my nephew is now on the Hawks. Like you got to watch out for him type of thing. And, um, and so for playing against him all year, I think he had that in the back of his mind and knew he was going to switch with me the very last game. And so they beat us. I think that year we actually we were three and one against the heat. Um, so they beat us the last time we played them. And I remember I, I was walking on off the court kind of pissed and uh, in the NBA, you don't shake, usually you don't shake the other team's hands. The first couple of games you play them, it's kind of like a wave and you walk off the court. But the last time you play any team, that's where it's like you go through the handshake lines and you say hi to everybody and whatnot. And so I remember that. So I was like, oh, I'm supposed to like go whatever, like say hi to these guys or whatever. Um, so I, as I turn to walk back on the court, he's standing there and he kind of like motioned towards me. And from knowing it was his last season and kind of what he'd been doing, um, I knew right away, I was like, oh, damn, like, we're about to exchange jerseys. And, and that moment was cool, um, just hearing him say he'd been following me and, and uh, for me just being like, man, I can't believe I'm playing against you in that, that type of sense. Uh, it was a really cool moment. And now I got his jersey framed and I get to talk about it. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, now going from vets you played against to some vets you played with, uh, most notably being Vince Carter. Now you got Rajon Rondo. Um, you got guys like Gallo. Um, coming in, and even Clint Capello as a vet. Um, so what are some things that you've learned from from those guys that really helped elevate your game? A lot. Um, you know, so much in the NBA is, is how you conduct yourself off the court and the type of things you do to be ready every day, how you keep your body ready, um, you know, how you should work out. And there's so much that goes into, obviously, the, the 48 minutes that you see everybody play on, on, you know, during games. And so I think that's the biggest thing that I've taken away from those guys and those vets is, is everything else that goes into the game and everything else that you need to do to be a professional and stick around in this league. Because there's so many guys that are, that are so talented, guys that are more talented than me that aren't in the NBA. And, and a lot of that goes into not doing the right things to take care of themselves off the court. And um, so a guy like Vince, he was somebody – Vince was so smart, just he'd been in the NBA obviously for so long that he knew every team, he knew every coach, so he knew like every scheme. So we'd go in and we'd play, we'd play Doc Rivers at the time with the Clippers and, and he would know like three or four things that Doc Rivers always runs. And we would go in and play pop and, and all these coaches that had been around and, and he knew right away, we'd start the film, he goes, oh, Doc does this, pop does this. And, and he would like right away stand up and just call it out. And just to kind of have that brain in the room as we we're going through it was really cool. And then just being a part of his last season, you know, Vince is like a superstar. Like you would not imagine when we go on the road, how much attention he gets and, and how many people follow him. And just to see that being every arena, we go to every arena, his shooting times are like three hours before the game. And there's people out there with signs just trying to get a piece of them. And it's just different. Um, and then so far this year, yeah, with, with the vets we've had and we had Gallo and Rondo's kind of in the same boat with Vince of just being super smart. Um, you know, Rondo's already a guy that's already pulled a bunch of us in and watched film already. And he's like, hey, we need to get better playing with each other. Um, we, need to be, we need to be all be on the same page. And him obviously coming off a ring that all those vets, they're so good and they know how to do everything when they're not on the court. And then obviously they're a lot better once they're, once they're on. All right, so I'm going to put you on the spot here because we want to talk about some underrated basketball players. But um, so the question I'm going to ask you is who's the most underrated player in the NBA? And I'll give you a second to think about it while I tell you the people like that we usually mention. So it's usually like Drew Holiday and Bradley Beal. Um, those are some popular ones that come up a lot. So for you, who do you look at as a non-Hawk? Obviously, you don't have to talk about a teammate. But like, who do you look at in the NBA and think like, wow, that guy does not get the credit he deserves publicly? 
Yeah, Drew Holiday's definitely up there. Just because I'm not sure if he's been an All Star yet, but uh, and if he has, I don't, I'm sorry for that, but I can't remember. I don't know if he's been an All Star yet, but yeah, he's someone that even Bradley, like I think Bradley to an extent gets a little bit more attention just because he puts up 30 a game and he's kind of you know all his baskets are pretty tough. He he can score in pretty much any way he wants to. I think Drew's a guy that he just flies under the radar. And a lot of times is like the game just comes so easy to him. And he does on both ends. He's a defender. Um, other guys that I think are, are unbelievable offense players, like Zach Levine is somebody who from playing against him really impressed me. Everyone's like, oh, this dunker and, and, and everything. He's the only remember for his athleticism, but like the guy is an all-star. And he may not be as good as Drew or, or someone like that on the defensive end, but in terms of offensively underrated that no one talks about, like that guy's tough. Um, trying to think, like there's a bunch of guys um, that are out there that are obviously good, but it's hard to say guys on losing teams, obviously, because like, you know, I feel like there's a lot of guys you put them on losing team, their numbers, and they can look good. But yeah, I would say I would say Zach. I think Drew Holiday is a really good one, though. So we were talking about this before we started, but I was telling Michael how I think it was your freshman year when you guys played Kansas State, and I was asking you like who who's good, like who's the best player you played against. And you said Wesley Wondu, and I kind of looked at you like what? <laughs> and then all of a sudden he turned into a pro, and now he's legit and playing for Dallas and and, and going to be a good pro. Yeah, no, he gave me a – I remember he was one of the few like guys that I was matched up on. He gave me like eighteen in that game, but I remember thinking like. I've never heard of this guy, and, like, he's he's good. And I think at the time he was a senior. Yeah, I remember telling you that. And, like, he was a second-round pick, and now he's playing for Orlando. Um, so, yeah, he, he was someone in college that was up to that point. I was like, this might be the best guy I've ever played against. Um, but, yeah, I, I feel like I feel like Drew Holiday. That was a good one. I'm curious if you guys came up with any other ones, but my mind's spacing a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I love all role players for me. <laughs> guys that can play both sides of the ball. Like, I'm a big Lou Dort fan. Um, like, Josh Green's my favorite rookie this year. Josh. Um, <laughs> um, but Drew Holiday did – he was an all-star in 2013 back when he was playing with Philly. Um, gotcha. I was before but, he was born pretty much, so you don't you – <laughs> <know. laughs> yeah, this was like this was like middle school days for Coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, so – for you, one of, I think one of your most underrated skills that doesn't get talked about enough is, is playmaking. I don't think um, people really understand how good of a playmaker you are and with your high basketball IQ, your ability to pass the ball, um, and then watching kind of the evolution of Coach Pierce's offense from your rookie year to now. Um, he's added some interesting wrinkles here. Um, I've noticed some Princeton concepts that you guys got. Um, and I think you're getting, get, you're going to have more of an opportunity to showcase your playmaking skills. What kind of things are you excited about with a relatively new offense this year um, from a play, playmaking aspect? Yeah, I'm excited for, for all that. I think that was something that in high school, that was a big part of my game. I played majority point guard in high school. Zach would remember that pretty well. Thanks. Um, but that was one of the biggest things, I think, even at the combine where, you know, in terms of people – me kind of like improving my draft stock. I think everyone knew like I could shoot. And then all of a sudden I go in that combine and that's what I was showing is like the playmaking and getting guys shots and, and defensively being there. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for this year. I think, you know, a lot of what we're doing, we're trying to get away of away from just purely losing, using ball screens. Um, we're trying to play a little bit faster. Obviously we have a deeper team. So we're trying to get up and down. Um, we have a couple of bigs that can run the floor. Clint Capella is one of the best bigs in the league of just purely running the floor and getting easy baskets. So I think in a lot of ways, we're trying to move the ball a little bit more this year, get guys touches. And, um, you know, my role will be a little bit different. Obviously we've added some depth at the wing position. So, um, you know, moving in, playing probably more minutes with the second group and playing with Rondo and, and with Cam a little bit and, and with Bogey moving on, you know, we have a lot of guys who can make plays and, and that's a big part of my game that I want to show. Cause I think, you know, that's something that I could really find guys and, and run an offense and get guys shots. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really think that um, your passing ability, especially with the guys that you've added to the team this year, it's going to really show this year. Um, but looking more defensively, I think defense is another part of your game that's underrated. Um, I think you're, 
uh, really good in help side, especially uh, knowing where to be. And something I've been noticing kind of in the NBA is trending towards more zone defense. I think Orlando the other day played 2-3 zone against you guys. Um, Nick Nurse was running some boxing one, triangle and two in the finals. You have Spolstra running a lot of zone. Um, ever since then, it kind of seems like the zone is making a comeback at the NBA level. What do you see that's the biggest difference attacking a zone um, defense in the NBA compared to college, like someone against like Syracuse or something? Yeah, just the spacing. Um, you know, in the NBA, there's still the three second, um, still three second rules. So you can't play, you really can't play a two three zone in the NBA, or, or it's tough to. I know the Miami did a little bit last year, um, but the big is kind of in the middle. He's he's got to be strategic with how he does it. Um, he's obviously he's got to get in and out. So I think that's the biggest difference. Of Syracuse can can stick some seven footer in the paint, and keep him there all game, and you can't do that as much in the NBA. But I think the biggest thing why you're seeing changed back towards trying to clog up the paint is is there's so many guys that are so good when they when they get themselves into the paint and they call in the NBA is you try to limit paint touches and and guys that can break down your defense and get in the paint it just it causes havoc on your defense and so every team is trying to figure out how can we contain guys and, and keep them out of the paint and obviously the NBA especially the last couple of years is everybody's shooting threes now and the game is spacing and the NBA wants us to play faster. There's more fouls, but at the end of the day, the ability to get to the hoop and get easy baskets is still the, what you try to do in basketball and three point shot will come second. And so every team is trying to find a way to clog up the paint. And um, if, if that means moving to more zone, uh, that'll work. But I know teams are, it's not a Virginia style. It's not a pack line defense, but it's, it's holding the nail. Um, it's being in your shifts. It's protecting the paints, protecting the rim. And um, it's definitely, it's becoming a big emphasis. I know it's a big emphasis for us this year is keeping guys out of the lane. And tomorrow, someone like John Morant, John Morant's one of the best guys in the NBA at getting himself in a lane and making plays. Uh, so that's why I think we're seeing more of a shift towards more zone usage and a two, three. And, and uh, in the NBA, it's weird. You probably, there's not as many big bodies as there are, as there used to be like the big bodies where, um, like the Shacks and, and Zaza Pachulia is out of the NBA now, or, or uh, Ilgauskas or all these guys, and Yao Ming, like the guys that just have been used to just a true five men of sticking in the paint. You know, the game's now becoming Bam, who Bam is now on the perimeter, shoot floaters, and Draymond Green is playing a little bit of the five, and, and Clint Capella might be a little bit of an exception, but Nikola Jokic, all these fives that can play on the perimeter. So it's how can we play these guys that aren't true fives in a sense or, or can do more than a traditional five but still find a way to, to be really good defensively. So it's a different look. We'll see if it works. I'm curious, too, if teams are going to stick with it once the regular season comes out. I think the preseason is definitely time to work on things. Um, but yeah, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, it's been really interesting seeing the different types of kind of junk defenses that I've been uh, seeing lately. Um, but for you guys, I, I know defense is definitely a big emphasis for, for you this year, adding some, or at least getting more veterans, um, Tony Snell, Chris Dunn defensively, and then um, having Dre and, and Cam more experienced, kind of defensive-minded guys. Um, but with the amount of guys you've added, um, typically it takes a while for the teams to gel. Uh, but watching your first three preseason games, it seems like you guys have kind of gelled pretty quickly, um, adding nine guys. It's kind of surprising. Um, why do you think it's become so easy to play with guys like Gallo and Bogey? Because we got, we got really good voices in the gym. And, you know, even someone that, uh, that you didn't mention that's been a really, really good voice is, Solomon Hill, you know, he's someone that he just came off a of finals appearance with the Heat, and he's been someone that's just – he's been super vocal. And he's seen what it takes to make it to the top. Obviously, he, he didn't get over the hump and win it, but he's been someone that every day is probably the most vocal guy in the gym. And, and Rondo and all these guys that, you know, like I said, we've been, we've been watching film as a team without the coaches. And, and so I think that's definitely expedited the process of, of us trying to gel. And I, was, I think at this point – there's five guys that have been here since since last year, or maybe Bruno and Brandon Goodwin, there's six or seven. But um, we, we had a core group of guys that were good that were on the same page for the most part. And then you add just really good voices and guys that have won before in the past. Gallo's, you know, he was on the, the Thunder team last year that definitely overachieved and, and played a lot of minutes. Um, Bogey's someone that just basketball IQ-wise has a really – 
has a really high IQ. He's been playing international basketball for Serbia for – he's 27, so he's probably been playing for 26 years over there in Serbia on their national team. Um, but there's just re- just really good voices. And, and yeah, we, we added a bunch of guys. I think we have a lot of depth at every position, just trying to fill out a roster. This is going to be such a weird year. I think it's inevitable for someone on the team to get COVID. Um, unfortunately, it's probably inevitable for a couple of guys to get it. So it's how can we still have guys out and, and still have the guys to plug in and plug in and play and, and not lose a beat. And um, so I think that's why you've seen this add really good depth and guys that can do it on both sides of the ball. All right. So before I ask you this question, you have to send me a check in the mail in a few days. But um, <laughs> I know your your least or probably your most favorite description of yourself is how sneaky athletic you are. I know you love when people talk about your sneaky athleticism. <laughs> Um, but I don't think people actually know how athletic you really are. So you, you could have won two state championships in basketball. You got one. You won one in baseball. Um, you were a pretty good football player when you played when we played against you in Modified. <laughs> um, and I've seen you play golf before, so I know you can play golf a little bit too. So if you didn't play basketball, what would you be playing right now? I'd probably be playing baseball. Uh, maybe at this point in my life, a little bit of golf. I'm trying, you're trying to get me more into it. I'm definitely getting more into it. Played it a lot this back me, I'm not getting you into it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but probably baseball. Yeah, I've just been someone – I've always been a sports fan. You know, I've really – I've watched a lot of different sports. I've played a lot of different sports. Um, I was never someone that was allowed to just sit inside when I was a kid and play video games all day. So it was kind of like you go outside and you figure out something to do. And, and I kind of – I try to dab in a lot of different things. And I tell you, you can't get me on a soccer field and I won't look good. You probably can't get me on a lacrosse field or a swimming pool and I won't look good. But there's definitely – there's a couple other sports that – you know, just from playing in the backyard or playing with friends growing up and, and doing that, like I'm sure everybody has that you, you, you get to pick up. So I would say baseball, I would say it's definitely something I miss. I think I miss being outside. That was, that was something that was great about baseball is a switch up from basketball. All went to you're inside in a gym and then you get to the spring and summer and you're outside all day. Um, so that was definitely something that I miss about it. But Sneaky athleticism. They don't like to give you credit as a white guy until you prove it. So that's something I'm always constantly trying to prove. Did you hang up that Jimmy Butler poster yet from, from last year? Have not. <laughs> have not. Jimmy Butler's done pretty well for himself since that poster. So I've left him alone. All right. So this is, a, this is more for the Herder family in general. But we're going to put you on the spot. And you got to pick a three-on-three team with your family. So obviously you're one. But um, for background, your dad played at Siena played well at Siena, your brother played at Siena, played at Catholic, um, your sister's going to Providence, and your littlest sister probably is going somewhere pretty well too. Um, so you got to pick a three-on-three game. Who, who are you picking? Just because my sisters and myself are the only people currently still playing basketball in my family, I'm going with myself and Meg and Jill. I think we can take them. We can get uh, keep my dad out of the post and and try to let my brother shoot as many deep threes as he can. And I think we can take my mom for sure. She I'll might be the she dad, might be the sneaky one over there. Your dad's throwing elbows and your mom's gonna get to <laughs> somehow. So I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm letting I'm letting Megan Jill shoot though. They can do I'll do everything else. <laughs> uh, that's good. Um, but I've heard you're uh, pretty good at video games. I think I've seen you play Madden once or twice, but yeah, it didn't go too well for him. <laughs> yeah. Zach beat me up yeah. pretty good. That's why he crossed his arms when you asked that question. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think I, rem- I think I remember you losing Madden by a couple of touchdowns, but we won't go there. <laughs> uh, is it something you'd ever play, try to play competitively? To be honest, it isn't just because there's certain things that in my life I try to keep private. And, uh, you know, video-, video games for me in a lot of sense are – there are ways for me to, to stay connected with my friends, you know, friends from back home, and you get on and play. And, and to be honest, a lot of it is I don't want that part of my life to be filtered. I want it to just be free-flowing and, and how it would be if I was hanging out in the basement or hanging out with, with my buddies at, at a restaurant and just doing whatever. And so there's a lot of guys in the NBA that do the Twitch thing. Uh, they stream wherever. They're on YouTube. They post videos. Video games for me, and I'm not saying I'm probably not good enough to do the Twitch and do all that. So it's, it's not <laughs> I'll be a professional, but it's definitely a part of my life that I think I wanted to keep private um, and just keep that under wraps just to be able to get away from a lot of different things, uh, use it as a de-stressor and just connect with people that, you know, I don't see every day anymore. All right. So we're pretty much done here, but uh, we got some rapid fire stuff for you at the end, but really quick, I just want to give you a chance. So I'm not calling you Kawhi by any means, like you're a little more outgoing than that, but I'm also not saying you're the most outgoing. 
Um, but you're doing something really cool at home uh, in Half Moon and you're, and you're building a facility. So I just want to give you some time to talk about that. Yeah, we are. So it's finally, it's about a year in the making now. Uh, so this was always something, even when you're we growing up, I don't know if you know this, but my dad, Mr. Flaherty, um, you know, I think there's a couple different dads from Saratoga, all the Hoop Nation guys, Mr. Dufort. They were looking at actually doing a facility when we were probably, I was in fourth grade, you would have been in fifth grade. And it didn't end up working out, but I think it was always something that my dad and our family wanted to do someday. And so when I kind of got in the NBA, there had been people that had approached my dad about you know, different places they were trying to sell or, or different ways to, to put this project together. And, you know, one of the families that approached us was, was in Half Moon already, and they had a pretty good business plan. My dad knew the guy from Siena, so really felt comfortable with him. And they're pretty much like, hey, we got – we got the whole volleyball side figured out. Like we need a basketball partner. And so right away it was like, we can keep the facility in half moon. We don't have to put it in colony or down in Albany, even though I love those places, but I'm from, I'm from Cushman Park half moon. And to have the volleyball aspect of it, you know, volleyball for people that play it and people that know, but we're on the basketball side, but volleyball is just as big, if not bigger in their AU sense. Um, they have all these teams that travel and do all this, uh, the same thing that we do on the basketball side. So it was something that we really came together about a year ago and, and through Zoom meetings throughout COVID, we've stayed connected. Um, so it's the final project. It's about, it's about $11 million project. Uh, we have about five or six different investors in it, um, a project we've, lo we've worked on for a while. And they finally just broke ground about a month ago. They're doing all the site work. It's going to be off of exit nine, right? If you go past Lowe's up in Half Moon, um, facility we're, we're really, really excited about. It's going to have a full restaurant. Um, it's going to have cryotherapy. It's going to have nine volleyball courts, six basketball courts. It's going to have outdoor volleyball. We're going to have two beach volleyball courts. Uh, I think a year from now, we're going to put in a turf field outside to be able to do workouts on. It's going to ha have a full glass weight room. Upstairs, I think a year from now, or two years, sorry, a year after opening, we're going to have two golf simulators. Um, so there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different things that are going into it. Uh, at some point, we're, we might have an e-gaming center. We're going to have a full-time daycare that will be open from day one. So there's a lot of different things. I think it's a facility that if you've traveled a lot, there's a facility that exists everywhere else, it seems, but the Capital District. And so for us to kind of bring it to the 518 and for all the sports people that – that are up there uh it's something that we've needed for a long time just as high schools are getting tougher and tougher to get into and uh some are really excited about so we just broke ground we're hoping to open this summer at some point and um and yeah that, that's about it yeah that's awesome i'm super excited for it and i mean i feel like there's there's a hundred affirms affirms all over the place for soccer and right now we finally got somewhere there's a basketball court and volleyball court so um that's really awesome. And I appreciate you. The shout out to Colony. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's good. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, uh, the kind of the last thing we're going to do is do a little bit of rapid fire stuff. Um, I'm going to give you a choice, this or that. You just have to real, real quickly pick what you, um, one or the other. Um, so I'm just going to go through first one, Jordan or LeBron. LeBron. Play, PlayStation, PlayStation or Xbox. Call of Duty or Fortnite? That's a tie. <laughs> uh, I was like There's Fortnite no for two years, but I've been I've been Call of Duty as well. I would say, I would say Call of Duty. Call of Duty. Okay. What's your favorite Call of Duty? Modern Warfare Three. Modern Warfare Two. You can only play single player. So me and my brother always used to fight. Modern Warfare Three. They finally <laughs> put in split screen, so me and my brother could play at the same time. So definitely Modern Warfare Three. That's fair. That's fair. Um, living in New York or living in Georgia? Uh, uh, Non-weather related <laughs> New York. If you add in the fact that it's about 10 degrees cooler at all times of the year, 10 degrees warmer at all times of the year in Georgia. Okay. Um, hitting a game winning three or a game winning dunk? Game winning three. Biggie or Tupac? Biggie. I listen to Biggie more. Yeah. Stay with the East Coast. I like it. Um, <laughs> NFL Sunday or the Masters? 
NFL Sunday. It comes more often. The Masters, you got to wait for it once a year. NFL Sunday is like 16 weekends. 17, but. <laughs> uh, uh, who wins the title first, the Giants or the Yankees? The Yankees. I think the Yankees are, are one or two years away. Yeah. So we didn't mean to we didn't mean exactly. to bring up bad stuff with the uh, the rap stuff because I know you 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 and Trey and some of the younger guys almost got booed off the floor in Atlanta from from some bad memories of, of picking the wrong. I rap group. Well, I was picking. I mean, these people got realized like I wasn't listening. I think it, who did I pick? It was I think it was Rich the Kid or or Outcast. I was like, listen. I was like, I listen to Rich the Kid. Like currently, I don't listen to Outcast anymore. So I probably should have known better uh, at the time to pick the popular one, but. Yeah, I got killed for that. Like, I, I, were, I was in the huddle, and all of a sudden just heard, like, a big, like, aw, boo type of combination. I look up, I'm like, damn, like, that's me. Like, what did I say? Yeah, there, there are some serious swear words being dropped all over the place on that one. Um, all right, so now we're going to do kind of some – a little bit longer, not quite as long, but don't worry about, like, long answers, just something quick. Um, so favorite teammate, it can be high school, college, NBA. My brother. I thought you were going to say Andrew Terrell, so. (laughs) Um, One second. (laughs) uh, All right, someone you wish you could have played with or against? My dad. Okay. Nice. Um, More importantly, is Eli Manning a Hall of Famer? Yes. Good. Uh, Giants are on the clock next year. Who's the draft pick? Jamar Chase. Knew that one was coming. (laughs) Uh, If you could go to one sporting event, Anything, any sport whatsoever, what would you pick? The World Series. Like game seven or any game? Yeah, game seven World Series at Yankee Stadium. All right, and you don't have to give a location for this one, but ideal vacation spot during All-Star break. Don't make people come find you on vacation, but where would you be going? <laughs> yeah, uh, a beach somewhere. I've done the Caribbean the past two years. All-Star break, you got to stay in the Caribbean just because you can't be flying overseas eight hours and expect to be back in two days so i'll probably keep switching out the bahamas never really loses jamaica was fun um i think i want to do turks and caicos st lucia i've never been to mexico but somewhere in the caribbean all right and then last one do we have to stop podcasting or can we keep going keep going this is fun you guys are good at this you guys got a great sports mind you gotta keep going that was the last question we want you to go back and play ps5 and enjoy <laughs> your, enjoy your off time before you play tomorrow um but in all seriousness thank you for doing this and stay healthy and have a good year yeah thank you guys this was a lot of fun maybe we could do it again at some time that's exactly what we wanted to hear <laughs> <laughs>